हेलो स्टूडेंट आर्मीज वेलकम बैक टू दीक्षा वेदांतु चैनल दिस इज योर बायोलॉजी मास्टर टीचर नव्या एंड लाइक यू ऑल नो दैट टुडे लेट्स प्रैक्टिस ऑल द एक्टिविटी क्वेश्चंस फ्रॉम बायोलॉजी सेक्शन ओके स्टूडेंट्स क्लियर विद दैट एंड वन मोर थिंग स्टूडेंट्स सॉरी फॉर द डिले आई एम रियली वेरी सॉरी फॉर द डिले देयर वाज सम टेक्निकल ग्लिच सो आई हैड टू फिक्स इट एंड इट टुक सम टाइम sorry for that i made you all wait okay and yeah so if you all are ready then let's start our today's session so before starting today's session once i would like to confirm that am i audible am i audible students is my voice clear yes yes the session has started and i'm audible right and good afternoon good afternoon uh, everyone and then before starting today's session once i would like to inform you all that already you all know by now right that see you can download notes and previous year questions for free the link is given in the description and also if you have not yet joined our telegram channel then you can join our telegram channel uh, the link for the telegram channel is also given in the description by joining to our telegram channel uh, you will get every day session update everything will be mentioned in the telegram channel okay students and every notes will be uploaded there as well and also will uh, you know uh, provide assignments will conduct mock test weekly mock test and all that okay students hi hi everyone sorry for the delay students once once again i'm sorry for the delay okay good afternoon sneha good afternoon good afternoon everyone okay so yeah we'll start our today's session okay with the first question lavanya lavanya yes lavanya i'll draw the cross uh, you had asked doubt no doubt no on the other day that the free ear lobe and attached ear lobe i'll draw that first shall we solve some few questions there is one activity uh, based on that also lavanya will be solving that hi lalit hi lalit hi everyone so shall we start students thank you thank you all it's all because of your support we achieved it and okay so shall we start with the first one shall we start with the first uh, activity from our first chapter in biology that is life processes okay so now the first activity is let's see what it is so first what are we supposed to do what is it asking us to do see first take a potted plant with you know a uh, variegated leaves for example money plant or croton so in case of money plant and croton what happens is that the leaf will not be fully green like this like you can see over here there will be in some places it will be like patchy the green color is like it is present like a patches in between here and there in that particular leaf okay which means to say that wherever it is green in color there the chlorophyll pigment will be present in the other the colorless region over there the chlorophyll pigment will not be present okay in plants like money plant and uh, crotons fine now what are they asking us to do keep the plant in a dark room for 3 days so that all the starch gets used up okay so what are we doing now we are placing that plant in dark room for 3 days so that see before that the plant was kept in a place where there was proper sunlight and even the plant was taken care by providing nutrients to the soil and also they were adding water also right so proper care was taken and then the plant also carried out its processes really very well like it can be uh, you know uh, preparing food through a process that is called as photosynthesis and it would have performed respiration and all that really very well so now what are they planning to do they want to stop that photosynthesis so what are they doing they are keeping that plant in dark room for 3 days so that in case if the plant would have prepared excess amount of glucose then that glu glucose will be stored in the form of starch right that is the extra amount of glucose so we want that stored amount of energy also to be utilized by the plant okay that's why we are keeping the plant in dark room for 3 days okay and now keep the plant in sunlight for about 6 hours 
So now what would have happened for three days we have kept the plant in dark room. The plant would have, wouldn't have carried out uh, photosynthesis, right. So now the plant does not have, does not have, uh, in the three days it would have utilized all the, you know, energy, all the glucose it would have utilized, respiration would have been uh, carried out. So now there is no glucose in plant. So now what are we doing? After three days we are placing that plant in a area where there is proper availability of sunlight for six hours because in that six hours we want that photosynthesis to take place, okay, clear. So now what are we doing? Now we want to check, we want to check that whether our thing is whether the entire leaf, whether the entire leaf has performed photosynthesis or only those region where it is green in color, whether that part has performed photosynthesis or not. Okay, so what are we doing? We plug the leaf from the plant and then first we will have to mark that green region. Okay, first we will have to mark the green spots on the leaf. Okay, fine. And then what are we doing? We dip the leaf in boiling water for few minutes and after this immerse it in a beaker containing alcohol. Why are we doing these two steps students? Because now what are we doing? We plug the leaf, now we want to check whether the leaf has performed photosynthesis or not. How will we find out? We should check if the leaf has starch content or not, okay. For that, if you want to find out whether the leaf has starch content or not, then for that we will have to use certain, uh, we will have to use indicators, right. So now, in case if the leaf has chlorophyll pigment, see it is a pigment which immerse which will you know it will reflect some colors right. So when chlorophyll pigment is present in the leaf that time if you add indicators then it will become difficult to find out. That is why what are we supposed to do now after plucking the leaf away from the plant after plucking it from the plant then what are we doing we are immersing it in, in the boiling water so that the cell wall will rupture and then we are dipping it in alcohol. When you wash it in alcohol, what happens is that the chloroplast, chloroplast is a cell organelle, right? Chloroplast and certain important cell organelles will be washed away, will be washed away from the leaf. That is why these two steps are done. To remove the cell organelles, particularly the chlorophyll pigment, okay? Because that should not affect our experiment for that purpose, okay? After that, what are they doing? Carefully place the above beaker in water bath and heat till the alcohol begins to boil, okay. So we are doing these steps, why? To remove that chlorophyll pigment because we want only starch to be present in the leaf, only starch, nothing but see photosynthesis would have occurred, okay. The glucose would have been produced. Now that excess glucose will be stored in the form of starch, okay. We want only starch, we do not want any other pigment, that is why we are doing this. Now what happens to the color of the leaf? What is the color? of the solution and then now dip the leaf in dilute solution of iodine for few minutes and then take out the leaf and rinse it off with iodine solution only. Now what are we doing over here? We are doing iodine tests. Why are we doing this? To check if the leaf has got starch content whether it is present throughout the leaf or only in the green region of the leaf. Okay, then observe the color of the leaf and compare this with tracing of the leaf that is done in the beginning. Okay, and then what can you conclude about the presence of starch in various area of the leaf? So, already I explained what are we doing over here, you understood why we are treating the leaf with the alcohol and all that. So, now what will happen when the iodine is added, you can see in the image. You can see in the image, right, the iodine, it will react with the starch content that is present in the leaf. When it reacts with the starch, then it will, you know, reflect blue color. That is why you get to see blue color. And then you can see in this image itself that the blue color is not present in the entire region of the leaf. It is present wherever that green color was there in the beginning. Green color was there in the beginning. So, which indicates that wherever there was that green patch on the leaf, only over there chlorophyll pigment is present, okay, and only.
only the if the chlorophyll pigment is there it plays very important role in photosynthesis how because the chlorophyll pigment is the only pigment which has the capacity to capture that solar energy and then that solar energy will be converted into chemical energy and then that energy will split the water molecule when the water molecule is broken the hydrogen is released and then oxygen is also it is thrown into the atmosphere right and then that hydrogen which is released from the water molecule that hydrogen will release the carbon dioxide into carbohydrate so the conclusion is that this is conducted this experiment is conducted to show the importance of chlorophyll pigment that is the conclusion okay so wherever chlorophyll pigment was present over there the photosynthesis has taken place okay students clear with this clear with this see now what what happens to the color of the leaf and what is the color of the solution see the leaf becomes colorless and then the chlorophyll is dissolved in the alcohol and the alcohol turns green see we are treating what did i say why are we treating that alcohol with the leaf because we want to remove the pigment so that once you remove the pigment see that chlorophyll pigment it gives green color if the leaf is still green color and for that if you add iodine solution then it is very difficult to get that blue color that's why first we'll have to remove the pigment that's why when you remove the pigment what happens the leaf does not have pigment the leaf does not have pigment that's why it will turn colorless and then the in solution chlorophyll pigment will be released that's why solution turns green in color okay clear with that clear with that and uh, shaksham shaksham right shaksham he in this channel will be teaching only in english if you want in hindi then there is one more channel if you want we'll send you the link of the channel later okay students clear with that okay and then what was the next question observe the color of the leaf and compare this with tracing of the leaf that is done in the beginning in the beginning we marked right in the beginning we had marked no those green patches right so now what did we observe see the green area of the leaf that turned dark blue why because over there the starch is present and when the iodine when the iodine reacts with the starch it turns blue black in color dark blue in color okay so hi hero hi hi rithik hi everyone okay and then it indicates the presence of starch this indicates the presence of starch clear with that students and then the colorless part over there starch is not there why because in that region there was no pigment like you can see in this image wherever there is green color that is present over there the chloroplast is present within chloroplast there is chlorophyll pigment whereas in the other region it is not there okay and then what can you conclude about the presence of starch in various area of the leaf see the blue color in the green area indicates the presence of starch and then the colorless shows there was no starch formation because there is no chloroplast okay students clear with that do you have any doubts from this activity or any doubts from uh, the you know the mode of nutrition in plants or any doubts from photosynthesis part shall we move on to the next one okay okay Rithik, again, if you want uh, me in this channel, we'll be explaining in English. If you want the explanation in Hindi, then there is one more channel for that. Okay. So, students, shall we move on to the next one? Fine. So, again, this activity is conducted to check the importance of carbon dioxide. To check the importance of carbon dioxide. Okay. So now, what are they doing in this uh, activity? Just look at the image. We'll see what are they doing. They have taken two, you know, plant, healthy plant. Again, the same thing. This plant would have, you know, uh, before considering, before taking it for experiment, this plant was taken care really well. Where uh, there was proper availability of sunlight, it was kept in a good ventilated area, and what it was nourished properly. Okay, and then they, we are taking this for experiment. which means to say that already the plant would have performed photosynthesis so the plant as of now the plant has starch content in them it has starch content in them okay now what are they doing is that in this in 
uh, near one uh, plant, they are keeping this KOH, potassium hydroxide in watch glass and then they are covering the plant with the help of this, you know, uh, jar, okay, and it is sealed with, they use a gel to seal this, okay, in order to make it carbon dioxide free, they are doing this and in next condition, over here, there is no KOH that is kept, okay. So now, what, what is happening is that the KOH that is present in this, in the first condition, this KOH, it has the capacity to capture carbon dioxide. The KOH, it captures carbon dioxide and carbonate is formed because of which in this first condition, the carbon dioxide will not be available. So you might get questions like this, what is the function of KOH, why is it used in this experiment? It is to, you know, absorb all the carbon dioxide. Okay, whereas in second condition KOH is not there, so carbon dioxide is present within this jar. Okay, so now what is happening in first condition, let us see that. So anyway, this uh, plant it is kept in a region where there is proper availability of sunlight. Okay, and even water will be added to this pot. So the plant has a sufficient amount of water, sufficient amount of mineral in the soil and it is also getting sunlight. Okay, and also the plant has already prepared food because when it was kept before uh, taking it for experiment, this was taken care. So, already the plant has performed photosynthesis. So, now the plant is having starch. It has stored glucose in them, this one. Okay, so now what happens is that there is no already stored glucose is there and photosynthesis would have been performed by this plant. When the after photosynthesis what happens? Oxygen is released, oxygen is released, oxygen really is released and food is also prepared. So now in how now plant also will have to perform certain uh, reactions, certain processes right for which they require energy. Now anyway they have starch. Now what are they supposed to do? Now they should break that starch first, that starch will be converted into glucose and then that glucose is broken down in the presence of oxygen, in the presence of oxygen to release energy, okay. They release energy, they get energy and they utilize that energy and after respiration what happens? CO2 is released, after respiration what happens? CO2 is released. CO2 is released after respiration. Now, but then in this setup, in this first image, there is KOH that is kept. This KOH will absorb the carbon dioxide. Now, what happens after some time is that the plant will utilize all the glucose. It will ut utilize all the glucose. It will conduct respiration continuously, okay, because of which carbon dioxide is released, okay, fine, but then that is captured. Now, again for performing photosynthesis, carbon dioxide will not be there in the setup A. As a result, what happens? This plant cannot survive for longer period of time. Whereas in the second condition, in the second condition, there is no KOH. So first what happens? The plant performs photosynthesis. There will be some carbon dioxide that is present in this jar. It will utilize that carbon dioxide. They will perform photosynthesis in the presence of sunlight. They utilize even water molecule, even chlorophyll pigment is present. And after photosynthesis, the glucose will be produced along with that the oxygen is released out, that oxygen will be col collected within this jar itself and then what happens to break that glucose molecule which they produced, okay, what are they doing? Again they are taking that oxygen back and respiration is carried out and again carbon dioxide is released out. But here KOH is not present, that is why the carbon dioxide will be available for the second plant and this plant will remain healthy for the longer period of time. Whereas this one, it will eventually die after some time because there will be no carbon dioxide. There will be no carbon dioxide that is, even if it is released, that will be absorbed by KOH. Uh, because of that, after some time, plant cannot perform photosynthesis. They cannot perform photosynthesis, no glucose will be produced and then there will be no respiration. Okay, clear with that? So this experiment is conducted, this experiment is conducted, why? To, you know, show the importance of carbon dioxide for photosynthesis to take place, okay? So this KOH, what happens is that KOH plus CO2, you get 
to CO3. This is a carbonate which cannot be used up. This cannot be used up. Okay. So, there is a student who asked me to repeat it again. Do you have any doubt in this student? Uh, see, if you have not, if you have any doubt, you ask me from this section. Uh, I will explain it to you. If you again, I will have to move to the next question, students, because there are so many activities, right? So, if you if you just join the session, then do watch the session from the beginning. Okay, you just rewind it and watch because now I'll have to continue. Okay. Okay. So, what was the question? See. Do both leaves show the presence of same amount of starch? Answer is no. It will not show same amount of starch. Why? Because in this case, the carbon dioxide is absorbed by KOH. So, after sometimes there will be no photosynthesis. Right. Okay. Whereas, in this case, they perform photosynthesis. They perform photosynthesis in case of this. That is why the amount of starch will not be same. In this condition, it is very less. In this condition, it is normal. Okay. And then next question, what can you conclude from this activity? Here, the amount of carbon dioxide, it affects the process and outcome of photosynthesis. Clear with that students? Okay. Do you have any doubts with this? Any doubts from this activity students? Because students, it is very important for you all to understand what is happening in that activity. Because they, you get most of the competency based questions from activities only. Okay, clear with that? Shall we move on to the next? Or you have any doubts in this? We will move on to the next. Okay. Okay. So, this activity, you want me to repeat it again? You want me to repeat this? Okay. Let me repeat it for you. Okay. Let me erase this once. Now, what are they saying in this activity? Take two healthy, huh. take two healthy potted plant which are nearly the same size. You want me to repeat students? If you do not want me to repeat, then I will move on to the next question. Nitesh, right? Nitesh, shall I move to the next one then? Nitesh? Or you want me to repeat again? You are saying no, no. So, I you ask? I, you do not want me to go to next question or do you want me to explain the same one? Come on, comment in the comment section. Okay, if you are clear with this, then I will move on to the next one. Okay. So, now this, this activity is conducted to test you know, uh, to show the, uh, the functioning of salivary amylase. This is uh, to check the activity of salivary amylase. Okay. Okay. Okay, Nitesh, we will continue with this now. So, now what are they saying? Take 1 ml of starch solution, which is of 1 percent in 2 test tubes. Now, we will have to take 2 test tube, test tube A and test tube B. Okay. And then add in, uh, one, in both the test tube, we are adding 1 ml of starch solution. We are adding starch solution. Okay. And then add 1 ml of saliva to the test tube A and leave both test tube undisturbed for 20 to 30 minutes. So, you are taking 2 test tubes. In both the test tube, you are adding starch. In both the test tube, you are adding starch. And then in one test tube, that is test tube A. Let us say, this is test tube A and test tube B. Here there is starch solution in both and only in test tube A. Only in test tube A we are adding saliva. 1 ml of saliva and we are just leaving it for 20 to 30 minutes. And then what will we notice? 
Now add few drop of dilute iodine solution. So for both the test tube we are adding dilute iodine solution. Okay. And then what does this indicate? Then in which test tube do you observe color change? In which one do you think there will be color change? See this experiment is similar to our the first activity which we did. We did uh, in that money plant no that one. Over there it is done in plants but here we are checking the activity of salivary amylase. Okay. Now what do you observe? And then what does this indicate about the presence or absence of the starch in two test tubes? And what does this tell us about the action of saliva on starch is the question. So now what happens like you all know, see if the starch is present. If the starch is present and when you add saliva, what is present in saliva? Salivary amylase enzyme is present in saliva. Okay, so what is the function of salivary amylase? What does salivary amylase do? The salivary amylase, it breaks, it breaks the starch into maltose. We studied this when we were doing human digestive system, right? The same thing is happening over here. The same thing is happening over here. So, in test tube A, there is salivary amylase. In test tube B, salivary amylase is not there. So, in test tube A, salivary amylase is there, right? So, what happens? That starch is converted to maltose which means to say that in test tube A there is no starch instead there is maltose. Whereas in test tube B there is no salivary amylase which means to say that the starch remain as it is in test tube B. Starch remains as it is in test tube B. So now when you add iodine in test tube A there is no starch because it is converted to maltose. That is why test tube A do you think the color uh, change will be noticed in test tube A? Answer is no. Why? Because there is no starch. Whereas in test tube B, when you add iodine solution, that iodine, that iodine it will react with starch. When it reacts with starch, it forms certain, there will be certain chemical reaction that takes place between iodine as well as starch. It forms certain bonds. Because of that, it shows, it will reflect the blue color dark blue in color, blackish blue or dark blue purple color, okay. So you will notice color change in B, whereas in A it is, there was no color change, why? What was present? What did we add? We add saliva, what is there in saliva? It is salivary amylase, okay. So what was the question? See in which test tube do you observe color change? It is test tube B because we did not add saliva to the test tube B, that is why color change is noticed in test tube B, okay. And then what does this indicate about the presence or absence of the starch in both the test tube? See in test tube A like I told you, now there is no starch because we added saliva and that salivary amylase converted starch into maltose. Okay, so there is no starch in test tube A. Whereas in test tube B what happens? The starch remain as it is because there is no salivary amylase that is present in B. We did not add any saliva, so there is no salivary amylase, right? Okay. So that is, you will have to mention that test tube A does not contain starch whereas test tube B will have starch, okay. And then what does this tell us about the action of saliva on starch? Saliva, like I told you, saliva has got salivary amylase and that salivary amylase, it converts starch into maltose sugar, which is a sim, one of the simplest form of sugar, okay. So this is all about the activity 36.3. Okay, wherein they are checking the, uh, they, they are just testing the act, uh, the function of salivary amylase. Okay, clear with that? Shall we move on to next question students? Okay, so this here, the this one, this activity is uh, related to your respiration topic. Okay, so let us see what are they doing in this. Now look at this, okay, let me read, let me read this, okay. So now take some freshly prepared lime water, lime water, okay, in a test tube. So now we are taking two test tubes, in both the test tube what is present? Lime water is present, lime water is present, calcium carbonate is present, okay, and now blow air through this lime water, okay. In one test tube like this, we are blowing air, okay. And then note how long it takes.
makes for the lime water to turn milky. So, this one it turns milky, it turns milky, okay. Clear? Nitesh, Nitesh, I am not strict today. See, today there are so many activity questions, no? It would be better if we complete them. And then so that I want to give you people some time so that you can ask me your doubts as well. Okay? And okay, clear with that? So, now let us focus on this activity questions. Okay? So, now in the, in one condition, what are we doing? For one test tube, we are blowing it. We are blowing and we are checking when that lime water will turn milky. Okay? And then in the other test tube, in the other test tube, what are we doing? You can either use syringe, you can either use syringe or pichkari to pass air through some fresh lime water, okay, taken in another test tube. So, in the second test tube, in another test tube, what are we doing? We are again letting the air into the test tube with the help of pichkari or else you can use syringe also. So, the difference is that here we are letting the air that is present in the environment into the test tube. Whereas, in this condition, we ourselves are blowing it, okay. And now, the activity is, you should check that out of these two test tube, which test tube will turn milky fast is the question, okay. Is it B? In B, lime water, anyway lime water is there, when the lime water reacts with carbon dioxide, reacts with carbon dioxide, it turns milky, it turns milky, you get that white precipitate kind of stuff. Okay, because calcium hydroxide will be formed here, also it will form, but it is very late. Here it forms very slowly, which indicates that, which indicates that when you exhale, when we human beings exhale, we exhale large amount of carbon dioxide. That is why in test tube B, fastly the lime water, it turns milky very fast. Whereas in test tube A, it does not turn so fastly because See, in our, at in our atmosphere, along with carbon dioxide, there are other gaseous substance, gaseous elements that are present. Because of that, what happens? Test tube B, it turns milky fastly compared to test tube A. So, this activity is done to prove that when you exhale, when we exhale, we exhale large amount of carbon dioxide. Okay? Hi, students. Hi, hi. Nitesh, Nitesh, at the end, I will mention my Insta ID, you can ask doubts over there also. Okay? Clear? So, now did you all understand why did we conduct this experiment? The conclusion is that we want to prove that when you exhale, we exhale large amount of carbon dioxide. We exhale large amount of carbon dioxide. Okay? So, that is what. See, note how long it takes for this lime water to turn milky. And then what does this tell us about the amount of carbon dioxide in the air? that we breathe out is the question, that we breathe out is the question, okay. So, conclusion is that this turns uh, milky fastly because of the formation of calcium hydroxide. See, when the calcium carbonate reacts with carbon dioxide, calcium hydroxide is formed, okay. And this turns milky fastly and this activity is conducted to prove that when you exhale, when we exhale, large amount of carbon dioxide is released. Okay? Clear with that? Fine. So, we will move on to the next activity. Before that, till now, we have conducted, we have studied, we understood about four activities, right? Do you have any doubts in any of those previous four activities, students? If you have any doubts, feel free to comment in the comment section. Feel free to comment in the comment section. Okay, there is a student who is asking me, ma'am, may you explain mutation? See, mutation, it is nothing but there is, it is in simple words, if I want you to tell, there is some mistake in the gene and that will lead to drastic, uh, it, it will have drastic effect on us. It can lead to disorder, you know, it can be very dangerous also. Okay, so all clear, we will move on to next question. Okay. So, now the next activity is that take some fruit juice or sugar solution and add some yeast to this. We should add yeast to this and take this mixture in a test tube that is fitted with one whole cork. I will show you the
the setup how it looks. Okay, so now what are we doing in a test tube? In a test tube, we are adding a fruit juice or something that is very sweet, a solution which is sweet. And then what are we doing? We are fixing a, we are closing it with the help of cork. That cork should have one hole. And through that hole, what are we doing? See, fit the cork with a bent glass tube. And through that hole, we are passing a glass tube. And then what are we doing? Dip the free end of the glass tube into the test tube containing freshly prepared lime water. Okay. What change is observed in the lime water and how long does it take for this change to occur is the question. And then what does this tell us about the products of fermentation? Okay. So, already see there is a term that is called yeast and there is fermentation. So, we saw this right when we were doing anaerobic respiration. We saw anaerobic respiration ta will take place in human beings in case of muscle cells, only in muscle cells and then we saw that is called as lactic acid fermentation. <coughs> On the other hand, the anaerobic respiration that takes place with an yeast cell that is also called as alcoholic fermentation. Why? What is happening over there? The yeast, it will derive energy. How? By breaking down the glucose molecule in the absence of oxygen and then ATP is released. Two molecules of ATP is released along with that ethanol was released and carbon dioxide also was released. That is called as, that is also called as alcoholic fermentation. Why? Because over here ethanol is also being released. Okay, clear with that. So, now what are they doing and what did I say? Along with ATP and ethanol, carbon dioxide is also released. So, now in the other test tube, we are also placing the lime water, right? Let me show you how the setup looks like. It looks like this. So, there is a test tube. In this test tube, what is present in this test tube? There is fruit juice. It will be sweet. We will add sugar and all that. Okay, fine. And to the juice, we are also adding yeast. We are also adding yeast cells. Fine. Now, what are yeasts? Yeasts are there, you know, they are unicellular only, right? And what do they do? Some are multicellular also, some are un mostly they are unicellular, right? And what do they do? They utilize that. They utilize this sugar content that is present in the juice. Why? To derive energy. So, yeast cells, what are they doing? They absorb that uh, sugar uh, content that is there and they will break that sugar content and they will get ATP, two molecules of ATP along with that ethanol is released and also carbon dioxide is released. So, carbon dioxide will be released, right? That carbon dioxide will be passed on through this tube to the another test tube which is containing lime water, which has lime water, right? So, now what happens? What happens when the carbon dioxide gets mixed with the lime water? Already in the previous experiment we saw. So, now over here what should happen students? What happens to the lime water when the carbon dioxide gets mixed? Can you comment in the comment section what happens to that lime water? when the carbon dioxide is mixed, they will turn milky, right? They will turn milky. Why? Calcium hydroxide is formed. The carbon dioxide relies, uh, this one, calcium carbonate is formed, right? So, this experiment also proves that, see, uh, the yeast, one is anaerobic respiration is taking place, carbon dioxide is released and when the carbon dioxide gets mixed with the lime water, it turns milky. Okay, clear with that. So, what is the question? What change is observed in the lime water? How long does it take for this change to occur? See, the air taken out through the tube makes the lime water milky. Okay, and then what does this tell us about the product of fermentation? See, anaerobic respiration is taking place in the yeast cell. So, what is released? Carbon dioxide and alcohol released along with that two molecules of ATP is also produced which is utilized by the yeast cell. Okay, clear with this experiment students? Clear with this? Good afternoon, good afternoon everyone. You have any doubts in this students? You have any doubts? If you have any doubts, feel free to comment in the comment section.
okay fine so shall we move on to the next okay uh, shri this is from life process chapter today we are solving all the activities from the biology chapters from your class 10 that is from life process chapter from control and coordination and from how do organism reproduce and then heredity chapter and finally from our environment chapter also will be solving all the will be practicing all the activity questions see understanding activity question is very important why because from this you can get competency based questions from the same concepts so if you understand the activity really very well then you can answer your competency based question which is very important okay this chapter it is this this activity is from life process chapter okay students we'll move on to that we'll shall we move on to next question okay so now observe fish in an aquarium you all would have seen you all would have seen right that they open and close their mouth and gills right and then see behind their eyes also open and close the gills you know the, you would have seen no fishes that's how they take in the dissolved oxygen right they open mouth and gills and then they take in the dissolved oxygen right now the question is see you all would have seen that now the question that they are asking is do you think that they open the mouth as well as gills together at a time do they open and close or is it like this first they will open mouth then they will close it and then they will open the gills and then they will close it does it happening simultaneously or one after the other whether you all have observed it see that's what they are asking are the timing of the opening and closing of the mouth and gill slits coordinated in some manner are they coordinated do you think it is the same do you think it is happening simultaneously is the question and then next is that count the number of times the fish opens and closes its mouth in a minute so in a minute how many times is it closing its mouth how many times it is opening and closing have you ever observed that it is very fast i would say that it is very fast that it is difficult to count also it is that fast like at times we lose the count right we'll have to concentrate a lot when you actually most of you wouldn't have observed it right you would have seen that yes they'll open mouth and gills the, do they do that uh, together simultaneously or one after the other and then they are also asking you to compare this to the number of times you breathe in and out in a minute which means to say that they are asking us to compare the rate of breathing in aquatic animal as well as terrestrial animal that's why they are asking us to compare this to the number of times you breathe nothing but see we stay on land not in water right so is the breath rate same for us and the aquatic animal is the question you all would have observed this right yeah no you all would have observed right see the thing is yes the fish they do it simultaneously they open their mouth and gill slit in a coordinated manner and timing okay and always you know it it is somewhere around 100 times it can go up to 90 to 100 times they open their gills and mouth in a minute why which means to say that their rate of breathing is very fast their rate of breathing is very fast because they get dissolved oxygen because they get dissolved oxygen right now compare this to the number of time you breathe in and out in a minute okay so the thing is that see it's because they're getting dissolved oxygen they will they will have to their breathing rate will be high because they want more oxygen whereas we are staying on land and we are getting good amount of oxygen so our rate of breathing is less when you compare with the aquatic animals clear with that always aqu aquatic animals breathing rate is very high whereas ours it is very less when you compare with them okay students clear with that see the amount of dissolved oxygen this is o2 it is o2 is lower than that in the air okay so the rate of breathing in fishes is always faster than that in the terrestrial organism okay the normal respiratory rate of an adult human is it is 12 to 16 times per minute so 
we human beings, our rate of breathing it is 12 to 16 times per minute. Whereas fishes, see it can go up to 100 per minute. So, our rate of breathing is less when you compare with the aquatic animals. Clear with that students? Okay, clear with that? Shall we move on to the next one? Do you have any doubt in this? Do you have any doubt in this section? Okay, I will move on to the next question. Next activity. Okay. So, here visit a health center in your locality and find out what is the normal range of hemoglobin content in human beings. Okay. And then is it the same for children and adult? So, actually you had to do this you will have to go visit nearby hospital and find out what is like near nearby healthcare center you will have to visit and find out that what is the normal range of hemo hemoglobin in human being and is it the same for children and adult obviously no it, it varies okay and then is there any difference in the hemoglobin level for men and women yeah there will be some difference it is not the same for men and women why because of hormonal influence okay and then also visit a veterinary clinic in your locality and find out what is the normal range of hemoglobin content in an animal like buffalo or cow so now they are they want us to compare our hemoglobin level with the animals as well to check if it is same for animals and human being what do you think do you think it will be same for both animals and we human being do you think the hemoglobin level will be same no, there also it varies, right. What do you think whether humans will have more hemoglobin or animals? What do you think students? Okay, so that is, uh, they are questioning this, okay. And next one is that, is this content different in cough male and female animals? See, always there will be some differences, it will not be the same, okay. And compare the difference that is seen in male and female human being and animals, Okay, and then how would the difference, if any, be explained? See, the thing is, there will be differences. The hemoglobin level will not be same for everyone. There will be some differences. Okay, so the thing is, now we will have to find out what is that hemoglobin level in each, in female, males, in children and also in animals. And then you will have to compare and see. This one, you will have to remember these you know, units. Questions can be asked in MCQs, okay. You will have to remember these units. See, in, in case of men, it is 14 to 17 gram per 100 ml is the hemoglobin. Whereas for female, it is less, 12 to 50 gram per 100 ml, okay. And in case of children, it is 11 to 16 gram per 100 ml. So, it, it varies, okay. And you will have to remember this. You will have to remember this. These uh, units you will have to remember. Okay. And then, so is it the same for children and adult? No. For adults, it ranges from 12 to 17. Whereas for children, it is 11 to 16. Right. So, it varies. Okay. And is there any difference in the hemoglobin level? Yes, you can see. That's why if you remember these, if you remember these terms, those exact numbers, if you remember, you can answer these questions when it is asked in exam. Okay. No, it is not the same and you will have to mention how much it is for men and how much is it for women. You see these differences, the reason is because of hormones. See the hormones also varies right in male and female. That is why you get to see difference in hemoglobin level also. Okay. And then also they ask us to compare with the animals also right animals like cow and buffalo so here the normal level of hemoglobin in animals like cow and buffalo is 10.4 to 16 gram per 100 ml it varies from 10.4 to 16 it varies from 10.4 to 16 so it can be in between also it can be 11 12 13 right okay so now compare the difference that is seen in male and female human being as well as animal so, the, it is not the same. Usually, what, you, what did you notice? We human beings, it can go up to 17 
17 grams which means to say that human beings have more hemoglobin than animals than animals see concept is simple because we perform more activity right and then uh, we require more energy because of that we demand more oxygen and because of that because of that the hemoglobin, hemoglobin level is high in human beings okay clear with that and then how would the difference explain is the thing right wait let me can you see here and then how would the difference if any be explained see here the human body needs more oxygen like I told you it requires more oxygen to do certain works that is why in human beings that is why in human beings the hemoglobin is more compared with animals ok can you see now students this question was not seen clearly when it was presented ok can you see this now ok clear with this concept shall we move on to next activity shall we move on to next activity so the thing that you will have to remember in this is you will have to remember these forget about animals thing it is not that important you will have to remember that how much hemoglobin is present in men how much hemoglobin is present in women and also in children and based on this the questions can be asked ok ok so now we will move on to next question next activity so again this is from the chapter life processes ok so let us see what the activity is take two small pots of approximately the same size and having the same amount of soil ok one should have plant in it place a stick of the same height as the plant in the other pot so now we are taking two pots which should be of equal size and it should have equal amount of soil in it and one will be uh, planted one, one is planted and the other one is not planted instead we are placing a stick of same height ok now cover the soil in both pots with a plastic sheet so that the moisture cannot escape by evaporation ok cover both set one with the plant and other with the stick with plastic sheet and place it in a bright sunlight for half an hour ok do you observe any difference in the two cases so what do you think that you will observe see in one pot there is a plant ok and that that pot is covered by a plastic sheet and there is one more pot in that there is no plant instead there is a stick that is placed and that pot is also covered by a plastic sheet and both these pots are kept in sunlight so after some time what will you observe what will you observe you will observe tiny water droplets right in the pot where there was plant whereas in the other one there is stick see stick is a non-living thing it does not perform any life processes it will not carry out any there will be no reaction that will be taking place in a stick right so now what happens is that the pot in which the plant was there now let us say this is a pot with plant and this is covered by a plastic sheet this is covered by a plastic sheet after some time you will observe water droplets you will observe water droplets on the inner surface of the plastic bag on the inner surface of the plastic bag what do you think would have happened how did this water droplets come over here answer is simple see the plant it performs you know right it performs so many processes why for their survival it is very important see even plant would have observed some excess amount of water from the soil right <coughs> so that excess amount of water will be evaporated by the plant which is not needed how through a process that is called as respiration so when respiration happens what happens is that 
crude stomata the water gets evaporated the excess amount of water gets evaporated and then that evaporated water in the form of water droplets they will get accumulated on the inner surface of the plastic because it cannot go out we are that that is the reason why we have covered the plastic sheet in order to observe those water droplets which indicates the transpiration process that is taking place in plant okay whereas in the other part which had stick there there will be no water droplets because that's a stick and that will not carry out any process any life processes okay so now the question is that do you observe any difference in both the cases yes like i told you the pot with plant the water droplets are found in the plastic sheets and why it is because the condensation of the water vapor that is released how through a process that is called as transpiration okay in the other pot the water droplets are not formed because over there there is no plant that's the reason okay students clear with that do you have any doubts from this part or else do you have any doubt from life process chapter like it can be you know uh, from mode of nutrition or human digestive system part or from respiration part do you have any doubt now we are this experiment is done uh, you know this falls under the transportation part transportation in plants after that concept this activity is there so do you have any doubts in uh, you know nutrition part transportation or respiration part is all activities clear till now shall we move on to the next shall we move on to next activity students okay so let's move on to the next activity okay so this is from the chapter control and coordination okay we have completed the activities that were given in life process chapter so any doubts from those activities students see understand again i'm telling you understanding activity is very important because your competency based question will be from these activities mostly right okay so now let's start with control and coordination part okay so this is that first activity that is present in the chapter control and coordination okay so let's see what the activity is all about okay put some sugar in your mouth how does it taste how when you eat sugar how does it taste obviously it tastes sweet you immediately you will get an okay it is sweet okay now block your nose by pressing it between your thumb and index finger now eat sugar again so now first you are eating sugar normally and you felt the taste you got to know right and then again you eat sugar just close the first you hold your nose tightly with the help of your thumb and index finger and then eat sugar and then they are asking you to find out the difference in its taste do you think the sugar tastes same or not hi sia good afternoon so do you think the taste remains same or it differs have you ever tried this experiment students and then third question is why eating lunch why eating lunch block your nose in the same way and notice if you can fully appreciate the taste of the food you are eating so here there is two condition here there is two kind one is first you are conducting the same activity with the sugar and second time you are conducting the same activity with your lunch so first you are eating sugar you felt the taste and then you closed your nose and ate sugar okay that time the question is do you feel the taste or not is the question the same thing you are doing with your lunch so first you eat lunch you felt the taste and again next time you are closing your you know nose and then again you eat just take a spoon or take a bite and just check the uh, difference in the taste it actually varies see in case of sugar the, the thing is students in case of sugar the taste will not vary whereas when you are having food when you are having lunch which is well cooked which contains oil which contains spices over there the taste varies so when you eat normally it will be more tasty when you close your nose and eat that time the taste varies completely so cia says no taste 
um, yeah, the taste actually taste will be there here, but then you will not be able to feel it completely when you close your nose. Okay, lack of O2, no taste. So, lack of oxygen, no taste. Okay, so, yeah, so you think it's because there will be no oxygen, that's why no taste. Actually, that is not the right uh, reason, Sia. Yeah. That is not the right reason. I will explain it to you now. See, what is, see, you know, we have five sensory organs, that is nose, you know, tongue, eyes, ears, your skin also, right. What did I say when I was doing control and coordination? I told you that in each sensory organ, there are receptors that are present. So, there are receptors that are present in nose, there are receptors that is present in tongue, there are receptors that is present in our ears, as well as skin, eyes and all that. Yeah, see, I am explaining it to you now, see. So, there are receptors that are present, right. So, now, when you eat sugar, does sugar have smell? Can you smell sugar is my question. <laughs> you cannot smell sugar, observe it. Well, so, it will be only sweet. You, you won't get the smell of sugar. So, now when you eat sugar, normally when you eat, so it is the function of your tongue. The receptors that are present in the tongue, they will send those sensory signal to the brain and then brain will send you message that, okay, it is sweet. Okay, here only tongue is playing role in case of sugar. That's why when you eat sugar normally or when you eat sugar just by closing the nose also, what happens? The taste of the sugar will not vary. Whereas, when you eat a well-cooked food, let's say you are eating biryani, okay? So, it is Sunday afternoon in most of the houses, biryani will be cooked, right? So, now let's say you are eating biryani, lots of spices will be added and there are certain uh, voluntary oil will also be added, right? So, it will have certain smell, okay? So, what happens is that you can smell biryani. So, your nose also tells like there are receptors that are present in your nose and also when you eat, there are receptors that is present in tongue. So, normally when you eat, what happens? The receptor that is present in the nose and the receptor that is present in the tongue, both what it does is it sends, it sends that signal, sensory signal to the brain and then brain sends a message that, okay, you are eating biryani, it is of this taste, the spice can be more or it can be less. Okay, maybe they would have added salt, sufficient amount of salt or not. It will tell us exactly. Okay, now when you close your nose and eat, what happens is that the nose will not be able to smell the biryani. Okay, so what happens? The nose is not sending any signal, whereas only tongue sends the signal. Because of that, because of that, there will be little difference in the taste. When you open, when you close your nose and eat, there will be some variation in the taste because there are certain... Uh, spices, there are certain, you know, oil and all that, they will have their own smell, okay. That also plays very important role in, you know, increasing the taste of the food. That is the reason. Sugar does not have smell. That is the reason. Like you can see, there are receptors. There are olfactory receptor, gustatory receptor and all that, okay. Clear with that? So, the same thing is been explained over here. First question. Put some sugar in your mouth, how does it taste? Yeah, like I told you, it, it is sweet, right? It is a combined perception of the tongue and nose, of the tongue and nose, okay. Now, block your nose by pressing it, the same thing when you close your nose. What happens? Yes, the general perception of taste is jointly created by the tongue and nose and when the nose is blocked, the sense of smell is lost, which in turn affects our taste. That is the reason which you will have to mention in your exam when this question is asked, okay. And while eating lunch, block your nose in the same way and notice if you can fully appreciate the taste. So, we cannot fully appreciate. There will be some variation in the taste. The reason is this, okay. Clear with this? Clear with this activity? Do you have any doubts from this activity, students? Do you have any doubts? Feel free to comment in the comment section. Okay, we will move on to the next one then. If you doubt, if you do not have any doubts, then we will move on to the next activity. Okay, okay. So, this activity like the image, it shows that you can see the shoot growing towards sunlight and then the root it is growing downwards. So, which means to say that this activity is related to trophic movement which we observe in the 
plants, right? Okay. So now let's see what they are doing in this particular activity. So now fill a conical flask with water, fine, and cover the neck of the flask with a wire mesh, okay, fine. Keep two to three freshly germinated bean seeds on the wired mesh. So the germinated seed, we are placing the germinated seed on the mesh, and then what are we doing? What are we doing? Take a cardboard box which is open from one side only. So what are we doing? Yes, Sia. Sia says phototropism. Yes, phototropism is happening over here. What about roots, Sia? What is happening to the roots? Okay. So now what are we doing? We have created this setup and then we are covering this conical flask with which is carrying that germinated seed with a cardboard which is opened only on one side. Which is opened only on one side, so that from one side only the sunlight should reach the plant. Okay, clear. And then keep the flask in the box in such a manner that one, the open side of the box faces light coming from the window. We should place it in such a way that the the open side through that the light will have to fall onto the shoot. Okay, fine. Then after two to three days, we should let this setup stay for two to three days, and then you will notice that the shoot bends towards the light and root away from the light. Now turn the flask so that the shoot are away from the light and root towards the light. Just leave it undisturbed in this condition for few days. So first it grows, first it grows towards the light and then root away from the light. Then what are we doing? Just we are rotating the conical flask. We rotate the conical flask to check. Now it is bent this way. Now when you rotate it, it will be bent that way. And again, you are letting it stay for some days. Again, after some days, you will notice that shoot growing towards light only, right? Nothing but like you all have told, phototropism is happening in the shoot, whereas geotropism is happening in the root. Root also hydro, right? Hydrotropism, nothing but even the root it grows towards wherever the water is available, right? So that's what is happening. Even if you live for some days, always the shoot will move towards the light. Like you all have told, oxen. There was one student who had mentioned oxen. Yes, it is the role of oxen that is present in the shoot. The oxen it plays very important role in bending the shoot towards sunlight. Okay, whereas oxen has inhibitory, like opposite action on the root. Okay, clear with that? So now. As the whole part of the shoot and root change direction, obviously it will change, right? And then, are there differences in the direction of the new growth? Yes, the growth will always the growth of the shoot will always be in the direction of sunlight. Okay. So what can we conclude from this activity? What can we conclude from this activity is that, see, the oxen. You know where is oxen mostly present? Shoot tip. It will be present in shoot tip. So. Now, what happens when a unidirectional sunlight, when a unidirectional light falls onto the shoot? At, let's say that this is a shoot tip. Let's say this is a shoot tip. Now there is equal. The oxygen is distributed equally at the tip. And now let's say that the sunlight falls this side. Sunlight falls this side. That time, what happens? The oxygen it moves to the shaded side it gets accumulated in the shaded region of the shoot in the shaded region of the shoot so first what happens the shoot also will have receptors which are sensitive to light they are photoreceptors those photoreceptor will detect the sunlight they will detect the light then what happens the oxygen will sense that and then immediately oxygen will move towards the shaded region of the shoot and then oxygen will get accumulated on one side of the shoot only because of that, what happens? What is the role of oxen? What is the role of oxen? Oxen it plays very important role in cell elongation. So now oxen has got accumulated over here. So over here, what happens? The cell elongation takes place. So now the cell elongates so much. It elongates so much in this region, in the shaded region, that it becomes heavy. And then what happens is that it bends. It bends towards sunlight. It bends towards sunlight. That is how oxygen is actually influencing the movement of the shoot towards sunlight. So now let us see in this region, in this region the oxygen is more, 
so here the growth will be very vigorous that's why there will be you know it will not be balanced because of which the weaker side will bend the weaker side is towards sunlight so it will bend over there the oxygen is not there that's why it will bend towards the sunlight and that movement is called as phototropism okay clear with that that's how the oxygen is playing role over there okay students clear with that see that was the question no how have the old part of the shoot and root changed the direction the old part of the shoot and root has no noticeable change in direction it says but then when it is kept in light in case if they ask what was the question when you turn when you turn and leave it for few days have the old part of the shoot and root changed the direction they won't change the direction instead it will be towards sunlight only it will be towards sunlight okay and then are there differences in the direction of the new growth the new growth part shows change in direction that is the shoot bends towards light and root bends away from it <coughs> and it goes towards the region where there is water which one root okay and what can we conclude from this activity the shoot shows phototropism and the root shows geotropism okay okay students clear with this activity shall we move on to the next one shall we move okay so this one is also from the control and coordination chapter right okay so now already there is this image right the endocrine glands now what we'll have to do is identify the endocrine gland that is mentioned in that figure i'll show you that and now some of these glands have been discussed in the text and then consult book in the libraries and discuss with your teachers to find out about the functions of other glands so some glands have been explained in your textbook and some glands like pineal gland thymus and all that is not explained right so they it is left for you you had to find out so students did you find out the function of pineal gland and all that see we know that there is hypothalamus and then there is pineal gland there is pituitary gland thyroid gland parathyroid gland thymus is there pancreas is there adrenal gland ovary and in case of male there is testis in case of male there is testis so now what is the function of these gland in this now i want you all to tell the function of pineal gland what is the function of pineal gland and also what is the function of thymus can you all say students what is the function of pineal gland and what is the function of thymus so like you all know hypothalamus it is like you know it's like a principal kind of stuff which regulates the activity of other glands so first the hypothalamus it will make pituitary gland release certain stimulating hormone and then that stimulating hormone will activate other glands to secrete hormone that's how it works right it is it is like hypothalamus and then hypothalamus controls your pituitary gland pituitary gland is called as is also called as master gland it secretes so many stimulating hormones which will control the activity of other glands after that after that uh, then it controls other gland other glands right hypothalamus pituitary and then it will control the respective glands when it is required to function okay so let's see one by one so hypothalamus it you know it will it will release certain hormone to regulate the pituitary gland okay and then like you can see over here there is pineal gland what is pineal gland doing it secretes a hormone which is called as melatonin it secretes hormone melatonin melatonin plays very important role in sleep cycle okay you fall asleep right why because the melatonin will be secreted by pineal gland okay and then comes pituitary gland then comes pituitary gland what is pituitary gland doing it's like master gland it will secrete growth hormone okay what does growth hormone do it uh, it will speed up the metabolism it helps in the uh, the growth overall growth and development of our body the growth hormone is secreted by pituitary gland along with that along with that it also secretes certain stimulating hormone certain stimulating 
hormones like uh, follicle stimulating hormone, lanthanizing hormone and uh, then there is uh, prolactin. What is follicle stimulating? FSH. What is FSH doing? Which is secreted by pituitary gland. It will, uh, you know, play very important role in, you know, in case of female. Ovulation. On the 14th day of menstrual period, it plays uh, the FSH. It will stimulate ovulation on the 14th day. In case of male, it is, it plays important role in spermatogenesis. And what about LSH? LSH, again, it, it plays very important role in female also and as well as male in, uh, you know, uh, to stimulate uh, the secretion of male hormone and female hormone, right. And then what is prolactin? It helps in the development of breast during pregnancy, right. And then even oxytocin, vasopressin, all these hormones are released by which one? It is pituitary gland, okay. And then comes male voice also gets switched ma'am in puberty because there are certain hormonal changes that takes place during that period. Because of those hormonal changes which you will see in both male and female because of that it varies in both male and female that is why certain character differs in male and female as well. One such character is in case of male is the change of voice. Okay and then comes thyroid gland. What does thyroid gland do? Thyroid gland it secretes thyroxin hormone okay and that also it plays important role in metabolism and then comes parathyroid gland what is parathyroid gland doing that actually it increases the calcium level in the blood right and then what is thymus doing see thymus is not explained in your syllabus what is thymus actually doing thymus it releases thymoxin thymus releases thymoxin that hormone it will actually activate the immune cells that will activate the immune cells okay and then comes pancreas pancreas is called as endocrine gland as well as exocrine gland why because the pancreas it also secretes pancreatic juice which we have seen in life process chapter that is which which will have certain digestive enzyme in it okay and that fluid is directly released into the small intestine right that duodenum part so it is released into the small intestine into the cavity open cavity right whereas in case of whereas in case of you know it also functions like endocrine gland why because the pancreas it also releases certain hormone like insulin and glucagon insulin it reduces the blood sugar level glucagon it increases the blood sugar level and hormones are released into bloodstream not into the open cavity that's why it is called as endocrine that's why your pancreas functions like both endocrine and exocrine gland. Okay, so here you ask then uh, causes of goiter. Goiter it is caused because of the imbalance in the thyroid gland. In case if the thyroxine is, see always one more thing students, the hormone will ha always have to be, uh, you know, secreted in a optimal amount on only. It should not be too high, it should not be too less. Okay, if it is high or if it is too less, it will cause certain disorders. Goiter is one of that disorder which is caused by uh, improper secretion of uh, thyroid gland. The thyroxine will not be secreted in that e proper amount. That time the goiter is noticed. And when there is iodine deficiency. And also when there is iodine deficiency. Okay, clear with that. And then moving on to adrenal gland. Adrenal gland, it is located on kidney. Adrenal gland. It, you know, uh, it releases hormone which is also called as fight, flight and fright, right. Nothing but this gland, it releases adrenaline. That adrenaline is released when you are very tensed. When there is some emergency situation that is happening, when some emergency condition occurs, that time you will get scared, you will get tensed or you will have to run from that place. That time this adrenal gland releases adrenaline hormone, okay. Ovary is seen in female ovary it releases two hormones estrogen and progesterone estrogen plays a very important role in menstrual cycle whereas menstruation whereas progesterone plays very important role in uh, pregnancy time and whereas testis it secretes testosterone okay students clear with that so these are the endocrine glands that are present these are the endocrine glands that are present yes see it can also be it is like stress hormone also like it, what it does is it increases the speed, it increases your blood pressure 
and immediately it will make the stored glucose available so that we get energy to immediately escape from that particular place so that you can react it will increase the speed okay clear with this students so you yeah, nothing but you will just have to know that what are all the types of glands that are present endocrine glands and which hormone is secreted and what is its function okay what was not there what was not explained in your ncert is i guess it is thymus and parathyroid gland and pineal gland so now clear with that students pineal gland secretes melatonin parathyroid gland it increases the calcium level in the blood and thymus it releases a hormone that is thymoxin that actually it activates or it matures the immune cells okay clear with that shall we move on to the next one okay so this it says activity 8.1 so we are moving on to the next chapter that is how do organism reproduce from how do organism reproduce from that chapter now let's solve the activities okay students so do you have any doubts till now in uh, control and coordination chapter or uh, in the life process chapter in any of the activity which i did till now any doubts if no doubts we can go further shall we move on to this okay so i hope your doubts are clear we'll start with this activity okay now dissolve 10 grams of sugar in 100 ml of water nothing but again we are making a solution we are preparing a sweet solution okay and then take 20 ml of this solution in a test tube and add a pinch of yeast granules to it so already we did this right already we this did this right okay so there is a student who says fear of bio exam no no you should not get scared now just with whatever time that is left prepare yourself well okay revise the concept what you have already studied revise them nicely and then give your best give your best that's it okay it's fine so now let's see this so now again we are preparing a sweet solution sugar solution to that we are adding yeast already we did this experiment activity similar activity two times but here the concept varies okay so now uh, what happens is that like you all know yeast it will utilize that sugar it will okay okay that is lavanya is it okay lavanya now i will you were asking a doubt uh, from that uh, attached ear lobe right detached and attached one there is a lot that's why so now instead of you thinking that okay there is so much instead of that just don't look at the content with whatever time that is available now how much ever is possible that much you you will have to study now and give your best if you sit and get scared now your efficiency will go low so now whatever time is available just make use of that okay okay lavanya now i'll draw okay students so now let me draw the uh, it is similar to mendel's experiment only lavanya it is very easy she was asking a doubt uh, related to that detached and attached ear lobe you wanted me to draw that crossing right it is similar to your pea plant let me draw that students after that i'll continue with this uh, activity okay anyway that is our first activity in this uh, how to organism reproduce chapter okay so now lavanya one more thing is that see always the free ear lobe is there no the one that is free that is detached let me indicate that as detached capital d it is dominant detached ear lobe is always dominant and then small d is there no that is attached attached ear lobe that is recessive that's why let me keep that as small so capital d indicates free ear lobe which is detached recessive one the other one is attached one this is attached ear lobe that is recessive okay so now when you cross this what happens you will get capital d small d right in the first generation <coughs> in f1 which means to say that there is capital d and small d right so this capital d is dominant 
which means to say that it will suppress the expression of small d. So, here the detached ear lobe is suppressing the expression of attached one. That is why in first generation every individual will have detached ear lobe. Okay. So, and next again when you self cross this, again when you self cross, again when you self cross what happens is that you will get capital, you will get a 1 is to 2 is to 1 ratio, the same thing right. See, let me draw that. capital D, small d, capital D, small d. See you will get D, capital D and capital D, capital D and small d and then capital D, small d. So, what did you get? There is dominant genotype 1 and then there is capital D, small d 2 times. Again this will be dominant and then there is small d small d. So, there is that one per there is this chance also that is why you had asked now there was a question ma'am if mom and dad and daughter have free ear lobe and son has attached ear lobe. This is the reason see this is 1 is to 2 is to 1 see this is completely recessive which means to say that attached ear lobe is possible right whereas these two maybe that son would have got this gene maybe that is the reason why the son has it attached ear lobe whereas daughter does not have, mom and dad does not have maybe the gene was recessive. Sometimes what happens out of that there is out of 160, 66 percent will get free lobe only free ear lobe because free ear lobe is the dominant one whereas the attached one is recessive. So, remaining 66 percent will get uh, free ear lobe whereas the remaining percent is there no they have high chances of getting attached ear lobe that is the reason. So, this is the genotype whereas phenotype is 3 is to 1 whereas phenotype, phenotype is 3 is to 1. Okay, Lavanya, did I clear your doubt? Yes, Lavanya, that, that you can take, you can take mom as DD and father as capital D and small d and or, or also can you know you can conduct test cross also. You might get questions like this, how will you confirm that, uh, how will you confirm the genotype? How can you do that? By test crossing, okay, clear with that. So, do not worry about this much, it is easy only, it is similar to that Mendel's P plan, the same concept, same concept, okay. That is what you should conduct the test cross then you will get to know the genotype, the exact genotype, okay. Shall we move on to that activity? We had started with how do organism reproduce, right? Shall we start with that? Okay, Lavanya, clear with that? Yes, Lavanya, that is what you can conduct test cross, can do that to find out the genotype and that is the reason the sun has got the attached ear lobe. This is the possibility. Okay. Uh, Mendel P, uh, P plant cross is also like this only dear. If it is monohybrid cross, monohybrid means there we will check uh, uh, that they, he was considering the height of the plant. If it is dihybrid cross, then over there we considered the size uh, of the, the shape of the uh, what P plant as well as we were considering the shape of the P plant as well as the this one what color of the pea plant okay clear with that test cross is nothing but here uh, the offspring is crossed with the recessive parent okay fine shall we move on to this then okay so now again we are preparing a sugar solution, to that we are adding yeast granules, to that we are adding yeast granules, okay. See, uh, one trait will study in monohybrid uh, cross, yes, 
only one character we are studying in mono that is why it is mono hybrid mono means single ok and then dihybrid means we are considering two traits ok. So, if we uh, you know d d and capital D small d then marks would not be deducted no dear marks would not be deducted that is what you should mention the reason draw that cross which I showed you just draw that and mention the genotype and phenotype that is the ratio and you will have to mention that percentage and the most important thing is you should mention that the capital D is that is the free ear lobe is the dominant one and the attached is recessive one you have to mention all these ok mention that draw that cross show that ratio and then mention that percentage there is that exact percentage dear I can comment in the comment section once the session is done ok clear with that. Uh, Sia says one trait will study in uh, mono hybrid cross. Yes, yes, it is only one trait that is considered in mono hybrid cross, one character. Okay, Lavanya, mention those things and I will tell you the exact percentage that usually it is 66 percentage. It is 66 percentage uh, people will mostly get free earlobes and the remaining percentage is the attached one. Okay, one time genotype can you do which uh, what genotype uh, dear Deva Priya, Deva Priyan right Deva Priyan what genotype or students now after this there are few activities from how to organism reproduce chapter after that we are moving on to heredity chapter only. So, when we move to heredity chapter we will do we will do those crosses okay. So, now shall we complete these students see even you students should sit and study right now after this we will complete this ok uh, Deva Priyan ok Deva Priyan I will do the genotype of the pea plant we will do the cross now let us do this now let us completely cover this Lavanya I hope I cleared your doubt no yeah Lavanya that is also correct you can mention that as well that is what along with that mention these points also that is what I told that point is also correct you can add that along with that you can add a note that free ear lobe is dominant one attached one is recessive you can if it is asked for three mark and all that then you can uh, draw the cross also it does not take much time and mention the genotype phenotype percentage and all that you will get complete marks ok ok. So, now we will start with this activity students fine. So, yeah like I told you see this is from, this is the first activity from how to organism reproduce chapter right. So, we are preparing a uh, sugar solution ok and to that we are adding yeast granules to that we are adding yeast granules ok. Now, put a cotton plug on the mouth of the test tube and keep it in warm place keep it in warm place ok. After one to one or two hours put a small drop of yeast culture from the test tube on a slide and cover it with a cover slip. Ok, you are welcome Lavanya, you are welcome and then observe the slide under microscope. So, now what do you think would happen over here? See mostly this happens right, uh, you would have noticed this during summer time when there is uh, the humidity is very high that time the food tends to get spoiled very fastly right. Why? Because the food uh, to get spoiled the uh, these yeast and all will actually spoil the food for yeast to get activated it requires warm temperature it requires that humid temperature right and along with that it it must require certain carbohydrate ok. So, now what are we doing is that we are letting that yeast to multiply for that to multiply the condition is it requires a warm temperature it requires warm temperature along with that it requires sugar also only then the yeast will multiply ok. And then they are asking you to observe under microscope nothing but when you observe it under microscope you will see the yeast multiplying that is it nothing much. So, for yeast to multiply it requires warm temperature along with that it also requires certain glucose molecule certain sugar molecules ok ok students. So, you will see budding in yeast ok. That is it. See here the activities that are uh, given in this how to organism reproduce is very easy. It is talking about asexual reproduction where see budding here what happens the parent body it splits 
and it will divide into you know one or more uh, pieces. The uh, parent body it divides into one or more cells and that particular cell has the capacity to develop into a new individual. So, your budding is happening. So, so for yeast to multiply it requires energy and it requires that particular temperature. That is what they are doing over here that is it nothing much which uh, indicates that yeast requires yeast requires high temperature warm temperature as well as sugar to multiply that is it. And then second, second activity is a wet wet a slight uh, wet, wet a slice of bread and keep it in a cool moist and dark place. Observe the surface of the slice with a magnifying glass. Record your observation for a week. So, what are they doing over here is that now there is what do you see? What do you see when you uh, when the bread is wet? It is a bit wet and you just keep it in a cool moist and dark place for some days. You will notice now if the bread is spoiled it will turn greenish in color. It will have that greenish color right. What is that greenish thing? What is developed over bread? They want you to observe that ok. It is actually you will see no rhizopus the spore formation you will see that uh, it will be a bit powdery powdery if you touch also do not touch even but be careful after touching you will have to wash your hands properly. You will see such type of uh, you know it will be a bit greenish in color that is nothing but it is actually rhizopus and the rhizopus how do they multiply they multiply with the help of this uh, you know spores the spores they are present in they are present in the bulb like structure they are present within this bulb like structure it is nothing but the heart it is a wall it is a thick wall that covers these spores within and when this uh, the bulb like structure when it ruptures what happens these spores are released and then these spores they can develop into a new individual they can develop into a new individual that is what is happening. So, again the condition is see what is this rhizopus what is rhizopus rhizopus is a type of fungi it is a type of fungi right. So, now what happens is that now the previous one which we saw was which one was that we were talking about yeast. Now for the yeast to multiply it wants warm temperature and it wants carbohydrate right. So, whereas for fungi fungi requires moist temperature it, it requires that uh, moist area moist condition it wants that watery thing I told you know see here they are making the slice of bread a bit wet and then they are keeping in a cool moist and dark place. So, this condition is required the wet condition cool moist and dark place is required for the fungus to multiply for that fungus to multiply over bread ok. Only then you will see this spore getting released and then this will multiply and then it will spoil the bread. You can observe this with the help of magnifying glass also ok clear with that. So, in the first activity we saw that how yeast is multiplying in second activity we are seeing how this particular fungi that is rhizopus is multiplying ok fine we will move on to next activity. The third activity is here we are talking about how amoeba multiplies. Again it is which type how does uh, amoeba reproduce again it is asexual reproduction right. So, how do they multiply it is binary fission it is binary fission right. So, now what are we doing observe a permanent slide on slide of amoeba under a microscope ok. Similarly, observe another permanent slide of my amoeba showing binary fission. Now, compare the obse observation of both the slide ok. See amoeba how do they reproduce through binary fission they reproduce through binary fission ok. So, first what happens you will see there is a cell and then slowly the nuclei will start dividing once the nuclei divides then the cell divides and then here binary fission in fission see fission is nothing but again over here the parent cell it splits into one or more cells and that each individual cell has the capacity to develop into a new individual ok. If the cell divides into two cell then it is binary fission and if that parent cell divides into more than two cells then it is multiple fission. Now here amoeba they reproduce through binary fission ok that is what we observe. 
okay see in the first slide the amoeba cell contains normal cytoplasm and nucleus see here you will have to observe two slides right in one permanent slide there is amoeba and in the other one the amoeba is actually it is showing binary fission so what do you observe is the was the question right see in the first slide the amoeba cell it contains a proper cytoplasm and nucleus whereas in the second slide that is showing binary fission there is this dividing nucleus nucleus divides and then constriction in the cytoplasm are observed it indicates that the amoeba is undergoing binary fission forming two daughter nuclei okay clear with that see the activities that are given in this uh, how the organism reproduce is very simple okay fine shall we move on to the next one next activity so next activity is about um see the collect water collect water from a lake or pond that appears dark green and contains filamentous structures you would have seen right if the lake is not maintained properly then on the surface of the lake you get to observe those green color thing growing on the you know uh, the you know surface of the pond right what is that green color thing nothing but it is algae right it is algae so now we will see that how algae multiply okay now put you have to collect that water and then put one or two filament on a slide so once you take that pond water it will have those algae collect that algae at least take one or two filament on the slide and then put a drop of glycerin on these filaments and cover it with a cover slip then observe the slide under a microscope okay can you identify the different tissues in the spirogyra filament so here the algae which we have chosen is spirogyra this is the most abundantly found algae in the pond water aram se you can get that okay so now it is filamentous it is filamentous and it is not branched also the body is filamentous okay now you should observe that filament now how do these spirogyra reproduce how do they multiply it is through fragmentation right so here the filament the spirogyra the algae you would have seen the image it is given in your textbook also that will split into many pieces and then nothing but they are broken into fragments they are the spirogyra is broken into fragment and then each fragment has got the capacity to develop into new individual so here the algae they multiply how through fragmentation so till now in this how the organism reproduce chapter first one we spoke about yeast how was yeast multiplying we saw that for yeast to multiply how do they multiply budding right for them to multiply what is the condition that is required they want warm temperature and they want sugar content glucose they require glucose okay and second one we spoke about fungi for fungi to multiply how was fungi multiplying it was through spore formation right second activity is all about fungi you saw the growing of this mold green color thing on the bread right you saw when you with the help of magnifying glasses when you observe that you will notice small granule stuff that is nothing but spores when the spore uh, gets the suitable condition like it requires uh, wet you know surrounding it requires moist surrounding only then they will multiply right so that time the uh, which one which one was that fungi will multiply it requires a uh, bit moist condition and how are they multiplying it is through spore formation okay after that we saw amoeba how was amoeba multiplying through binary fission through binary fission and now talking about algae which type of algae are we talking about we are talking about spirogyra now how does spirogyra multiply through fragmentation how are they multiplying through fragmentation okay and each fragment like i told you it will develop into new individual and one more thing students i know most of them they will get confused uh, between uh, the fragmentation as well as regeneration see fragmentation here what is happening is that the parent body it splits into two three fragments and that fragment will develop into new individual whereas in case of regeneration what happens is that the parent body is cut 
into pieces and that piece it has the capacity to develop into a functional individual okay and here it happens in emergency situation which one regeneration okay best example is lizard when you cut the tail of lizard after some time what happens the lizard still will develop that can be an example for regeneration okay clear with that shall we move on to next activity so the fifth activity is take a potato and observe its surface and observe its surface can notches be seen you would have seen right on the surface of the uh, the you know potato tiny uh, you outgrowth can be seen right granule kind of stuff right now cut the potato into small pieces such that some piece contain a notches or bud and some do not okay now spread some cotton on the tray and wet it fine place the potato pieces on this cotton note where the pieces with the buds are placed okay observe changes that is taking place in this potato in these potato pieces over the next few days and then make sure that the cotton is kept moist now what are we doing is that you would have seen right uh, on the surface of the potato the buds will be there okay now you cut those bud just a piece of potato having bud and place it on a cotton which is bit moist leave it for some days after some days you will see you will notice growth that bud will grow into you know green leafy uh, kind of structure La right uh, not leaf uh, shoot kind of structure you will notice that right and now which are the potato piece that give rise to fresh green shoot and root is the question so now what are we talking about so till now first one we spoke about budding second activity was about spore formation and third one was binary fission and then fourth one was fragmentation and now potato is example for which type of asexual reproduction see asexual reproduction which in which is seen in plant is it is vegetative propagation so here we are talking about vegetative propagation we are talking about vegetative propagation you can see over here those buds they develop into shoot right so now you see the potato peas having buds gradually grow and they develop okay if the proper condition is provided they grow and they develop right but there is no growth and development in the potato pieces without bud if there is no bud then there is no growth okay so now which are the potato pieces that give rise to fresh green shoots and roots so here the answer is the piece with the buds they give rise to fresh green shoot and root when the proper condition is provided okay students clear with that so this is an example for vegetative propagation example for vegetative propagation which is seen in plant so in case of vegetative propagation what is happening here seeds or spore is not involved instead a vegetative part of plant that develops into a new plant okay example is uh, like vegetative parts can be shoot leaf root and all that example for shoot is potato and ginger example for root is sweet potato and the example for the leaf you would have seen no in the bryophyllum in your textbook also it is there in the bryophyllum leaf at the notch of the leaf there was bud formation and that bud was developing into a new plant right clear with that shall we move on to next activity the next activity is select a money plant select a money plant cut some pieces such that they contain at least one leaf they must contain at least one leaf okay cut out some other portion between two leaves okay dip one end of all pieces in water and observe over the next few days okay which one grows and gives rise to fresh leaf what can you conclude from your observation again this activity again this activity is related to your vegetative propagation which can be seen in plant see some plants you would have seen right if you just cut the 
you know the stem completely for example rose you cut the stem and again place it in a new pot okay it will grow after some days you provide them proper you make them you place them in a place where there is proper sunlight that is available water them regularly nourish them they will grow right so the same thing in money plant also money plant if you you know cut off all the leaves from the stem and if you just place that one particular part of stem in the soil it will not grow whereas the stem uh, which has got leaf and if that stem is potted then it will grow why because in leaf what is there chloroplast is there which has got chlorophyll pigment and that chlorophyll pigment plays very important role in photosynthesis right and then so which means to say that the photosynthesis occurs and food will be generated and that food will be supplied to the stem so the money plant grows and if you take a money plant if you cut the stem which does not have leaf and if you just place that stem in the pot if you just plant them just like that then it will not grow it's because in leaf photosynthesis occurs which means to say that the food is prepared if leaf is not there then no food preparation then the plant will die okay and then there is now tea tea place hi hi good afternoon okay so that's what is observed in this particular activity okay ma'am will activity question come for exam uh, the thing is see you might see if the paper is easy you might get direct questions from this in case if the paper is bit difficult bit tough then they tend to ask competency based question from your activities see competency question competency based question will be asked every year mostly from where they will ask from the activity only they will ask from these concept they will ask that's why it is important for you to understand activities also okay fine so now the question was which one grows and gives rise to fresh leaf the portion of money plant with at least one leaf i told you know if the plant is with leaf then what happens photosynthesis takes place food will be generated and it will give rise to a fresh leaf and even the plant grows okay but no money plant without leaf dies if it is present without leaf then it dies okay and what can you conclude from your observation see the money plant with green leaves can synthesize food through like i told you through photosynthesis okay and is able to grow into a plant through vegetative propagation so till now what did we see we studied about even the previous activity was about vegetative propagation and even this activity is all about vegetative propagation okay that vegetative propagation was example uh for shoot okay from shoot even the rose is the best example for that okay and this one we're talking about the leaf over here if the leaf is not there then no photosynthesis if no photosynthesis the plant will die okay clear with this concept students shall we move on to next activity if all your doubts are clear okay so i guess this is the last activity from this chapter how do organism reproduce okay so now this activity says that soak few seeds of bengal gram nothing but channa and keep them overnight okay and then drain the excess water and cover the seeds with wet cloth and leave them for a day make sure that the seeds do not become dry fine you are letting it to sprout cut open the seed carefully and observe the different parts compare your observation with the figure and see if you can identify all the parts nothing but see uh, you are you know taking channa soaking it overnight tie them in a cloth tightly nothing but you are letting it to sprout okay after some days you will see right from the seed that white color portion coming out nothing but if you just let it stay for some days then that part will develop into root and then after some days so first that white color thing it comes out and it will move downward that develops into root and then after some days another white color portion it it grows outside it will come out of the seed just above that root portion and that develops into shoot okay the diagram is also given in your textbook 
there was the diagram no the seed is split it is broken it is split open and you will see plumule as well as radical the radical develops into root whereas plumule it develops into shoot and there was cotyledon what is the function of cotyledon it will nourish the developing embryo it will store the required food and it will nourish the developing embryo okay so here the two cotyledons of the seed can be observed showing rad showing radical and plumule radical will develop into root which will develop into root and plumule it will develop into shoot okay clear with that shall we move on to next activity students shall we move on to next activity so i guess we are done with the activities from this chapter now we are moving on to heredity chapter already i have explained this there was a student lavanya she was asking doubt from this attached earlobe and free earlobe so now this activity this activity is related to that okay so observe the ears of all the students in the class fine and then prepare a list of students having free and attached earlobe and calculate the percentage of students having each fine okay find out about the earlobes of the parent of each student in the class and correlate the earlobe type of each student with that of their parent based on the, this evidence suggest the possible rule for inheritance of earlobe types i have already i have already shown right i have crossed it and i showed you that what happens okay so now what happens is that see always the free ear lobe is dominant whereas attached ear lobe is recessive that's why mostly you get to see free ear lobes whereas the attached one is very less okay see this activity should be done by student in the classroom you should find out right yes deva priyan i will after this i will draw that i will cross and i'll show you okay in that pea plant mono hybrid cross right you were asking mono hybrid cross na i'll do that okay see now most of the individual have free ear lobe like you know and some very rare have attached one not everyone you would have noticed mostly everyone will have free ear lobes attached one is very less okay now for example in a classroom let's say 50 students are there out of them hardly four students will have attached whereas the remaining will have free i have already given explanation for this so now there is one more student who is asking me to show the mono hybrid cross okay we'll draw that now mono hybrid cross in pea plant so now let's say see always tall is dominant and then comes the recessive one this is short right this one is tall pea plant short now when this is crossed you get a tall plant with you know heterozygous and it is heterozygous because it has capital t small t and this is the f1 generation when f1 generation is self crossed there is capital t small t capital t and small t capital t small t small t small t so what is the genotype genotype is shall i write it here genotype is see you got <coughs> there is one capital t capital t and then there is two capital t and small t and then small t small t one right which means to say the ratio is 1 is to 2 is to 1 right whereas phenotype whereas phenotype phenotype is you got these three are tall right c 
see capital T, cap, capital T and uh, capital T small t. These are, it is tall, which means to say you got 3, right? And whereas only small t, small t, 1. So, the ratio is 3 is to 1. Genotypic ratio is 1 is to 2 is to 1, whereas phenotypic ratio is 3 is to 1, okay? Thank you, thank you students. Yes. Okay, Deva Priyan, clear with this? Shall we move on to next activity? There are only two activities from heredity chapter and they are very easy also. Okay. See, again the same, again the same one. See, now in the figure 9.3, what experiment would we do to confirm that the F2 generation did in fact have 1 is to 2 is to 1 ratio of capital T, capital T, capital T, small t, small t, small t trait combination. So, already I told you this, right? How will you find out the genotype? How will you confirm the genotype? You are welcome students, you are welcome. How will you find out the genotype? We will conduct test crossing. We will do test crossing and then we will find out, we will confirm that, okay, yes, this is the, this should be the gene like that, right? So, the same thing which I just explained, the same crossing is done over here, okay? And then what are we doing? We conduct test cross. What are we doing in this? It is a cross between the plant of unknown genotype with the recessive plant. With the recessive parent, we are crossing the unknown genotype. And then what do we do? Here the genotype of the tall plants are unknown, right? See, because tall plant, it can have capital T, capital T. It can have capital T, small t. Whereas if it is short, then obvi obviously it will be small t, small t because it is recessive. Along with small t, even if one capital T is there, then it will be dominant. So, recessive RMC you can find out. If the plant is short, if the plant is short, then RMC you can say that yes, it has this gene. That's why what are we doing? We are crossing the tall plants because tall plant, it can have capital T, capital T and it can have capital T, small t also. So, that's why we are crossing this. We are crossing this with the recessive one. We are crossing the unknown genotype with the recessive plant. So, when you do that, now let us say, let us say you are crossing this capital T with small t. What will you get? Again, if you get the dominant one, if you get the dominant only, then it is clear that yes, the gene is homozygous. Whereas, if you get the combination of again tall and short, then you will get to know that the tall plant is heterozygous. That is how we will find out, okay. So, now uh, can you do dihybrid, okay, you want me to do the dihybrid cross, okay. Student, after this there are hardly 4 activities, there are hardly 4, four not 4 sorry, 9 activities are there from our environment chapter, okay. After that I will do dihybrid cross. First shall, we will finish off this, we will finish off all the activity question and at the end I will solve your doubts, okay. Okay, students. So, you understood now why the test crossing is done. So, here the genotype of the tall plants are unknown. So, they are crossed with the recessive one. So, if the tall plant is pure, that is if it is homozygous, it produces only tall offspring. That is why we will find out that, okay, the tall plant has got homozygous gene, not the heterozygous one. Okay, so we move on to the next activity. Like I told you now, we have come to the last chapter. That is our environment chapter. We will fastly finish the activities that are present in this chapter and then I will do at the end dihybrid cross. Okay, fine. So, now let us study about the first activity, right. You might have seen an aquarium. Let us try to design one. You all would have seen aquarium, right. And you all would have played also in when you were small. If you see aquarium, it will be very attractive, right? You just go nearby, you will see what is present in the aquarium and all that, right? What are the things? Even you would have uh, bought one aquarium in your house, you would have decorated that aquarium, right? So, now what are the things that we need to keep in mind when we create an aquarium? 
the fish would need free space for swimming right it it could be a large jar also okay fine and also it requires water oxygen food as well fine and we can provide oxygen through an oxygen pump or aerator and fish food which is available in the market we give all these we provide all these right if we add few aquatic plants and animals it can become a self sustainable system right and then can you think how this happens an aquarium is an example of yes aquarium is an example of artificial ecosystem which is nothing but it is man made ecosystem right can we love the aquarium as such after we set it up and then why does it have to be cleaned once in a while and do we have to clean pond or lakes in the same manner why or why not see that is true right when you maintain an aquarium you will have to clean it again and again but if you are maintaining but what about pond do you think we clean that regularly it is left as it is but still it is maintained right how is that possible how is that possible see the question is can we leave the aquarium as such after we set it up why does it have to be clean once in a while and then do we have to clean ponds or lake in the same manner why or why not see the thing is aquarium you maintain them and when you are adding or uh, when you are maintaining aquarium you have to clean why because uh, the plant will release certain wastes and even the food will be left as it is okay and even the aquatic animal they will excrete right so they how if they get accumulated as it is in the aquarium it is very harmful because they are nitrogenous waste that's why we'll have to clean them regularly and then when it comes to pond the area is very large and the pond they have decomposers in them whereas in aquarium there are no decomposer that's why we'll have to clean the aquarium again and again okay clear with that see we cannot leave the aquarium as such after we set it up because why the main reason is see the decomposed food particles dead plant excreta of the plant etc they get accumulated in the water thus the concentration of nitrogenous waste like i told you the nitrogenous waste it will get accumulated okay therefore it has to be cleaned regularly whereas ponds and lake it does not require much of cleaning because they have decomposers in them there are certain microorganism which are, which can break those waste material break those waste material down okay clear with that and then even there is this natural phenomena that is rain right which will refill the pond with fresh water okay clear with that this was all about the first activity okay students students let's take let's take 3 minutes break 3 minutes break I'll get back to you in three minutes. Okay.
Okay, so let us continue with the activity questions. Okay, so this is our second activity, right? So now while creating an aquarium, did you? So this is also linked with the previous activity. Okay, let us see what it says. While creating an aquarium, did you take care not to put an aquatic animal which would eat others? Okay, what would have happened otherwise? Okay, then make groups and discuss how each of the above groups of organism are dependent on each other and then write the aquatic organism in order of who eats whom and from form a chain of at least three steps. Okay, fine. And then would you consider any one group of organism to be the primary important? Why or why not? So, these are the questions based on your observation and you would have seen all these. See, obviously when you are, you know, uh, when you want your fishes to survive in your aquarium, you will make sure that there should be no predators. There should be no predators. If the predators are there, then what happens? It will eat off the fishes and find nothing but there. It will attack the prey and then the prey will be killed and only predators will remain in the aquarium. That is why we will make sure that no predator fishes has to be there, right? And then also make a group and discuss that, see out of this, what should be the order? Nothing but you would have made that pyramid, right? The trophic, trophic levels, primary, secondary, tertiary and all that. Mostly in the primary level who will be there, it is always the producer, right? Nothing but here we can place aquatic plants and then comes the primary small fishes and then comes large fishes. That will be the order. And then it is also asking, would you consider any one group of organism to be the primary importance and why? Yes, because we consider producer, we give more importance to producer. Why? Producer is the only life form on earth which... What it does is which uh, you know is capable of capturing the solar energy and make the solar energy available to the other life form and it is the main producer of food, right? That is why we always give more importance to producers that is primary, okay? See that is what is being explained. So now when you are like I told you when you what, what was the question while creating, Wh while creating my voice is not clear students. Am I not audible? Okay, there was a student who is asking me, uh, ma'am, can you do biology class 9 marathon? Yes, student will be starting for class 9 also. Okay, will be starting for class 9 as well. My, um, am I not audible students? Is my voice clear or not? Yes, it is audible. Yes, just check with your device once because here it is audible students. I am audible, right? Okay. So, what was the question? See, while creating an aquarium, did you take care not to put any aquatic animal which would eat other? What would have happened otherwise? See, I told you know we should not add any predator fish. If you add what will happen? They will eat of other fishes and prey will not be there. Only predators will be there, right? So, if we add predator fish or animal to the aquarium, they will eat of other small fishes and finally, we will be left with predator. So, we should not mix predator fishes with the other fishes like prey, okay? And then make a group and discuss how each of the above group of organism are dependent on one another. See, you know, small fishes, they eat aquatic plants, they eat phytoplankton and aquatic plants and then they keep growing and then what happens? Check the overgrowth of the phy phytons and plants, okay? And then the small fishes they eat, they are eaten by the predator fishes and large fishes eat small fishes. Nothing but the large fishes eat small fishes and thus the balance is maintained in the aquatic ecosystem. Like I told you that is the order, right? There is aquatic plants, there are aquatic plants and then come small fishes and then comes large fishes. That is the order, no? Aquatic plant, small fishes, large fishes and larger fishes, okay? And then would you consider any one group of organism to be of primary importance? Why or why not? Yes, we consider certain life form, we give them primary importance, 
Why? Because that life form is capable of capturing light energy and solar energy and that is the life form which produces food. Which life form am I talking about? I am talking about the producers. See, producers nothing but plants. Plants are the only life form on earth which is capable of capturing that solar energy and then that solar energy is made available to other life form. And then it is that producer which actually, it is plant which actually produces food. Okay, and makes it available to the other life form. Right. So, in aquatic ecosystem or in all trophic level are important for successive level. But producers, but then producers are most important because they provide food to other trophic level as well. Okay, students, clear with that? Shall we move on to the next activity? Here it is very simple. So, in an aquarium, you should make sure that the predator fishes are not added. And also, you should, uh, they, here they ask you to just list down the order. Okay, what comes in the first trophic level, what comes in the second and third, and which life form is considered as the primary one. For which do, you, do we give primary importance? It is producers. Okay, fine. So, we will move on to next activity. The newspaper reports about pesticide level in ready-made food item are often seen these days and some states have banned these products. Debate in group the need for such bans. See that is true, right? You know, pesticides are chemicals. They are man-made and they are chemicals. Why do we add them to plants? Because we want to protect those crops from harmful microorganism which causes diseases. Right, that is why we add pesticides. But then you will have to be very careful while using those pesticides, right? Because what happens is that if you add excess amount of pesticides, then there are high chances that they will remain in the soil, okay? It will kill the soil microorganism which is beneficial for the plant growth. And also when that uh, is washed away, let us say there is irrigation system that washes off those chemicals to the nearby river and in the river there are fishes, the fishes consume those chemicals and what if we eat that fish or what if we consume that water, that chemical will get into our system and it will affect us. Right? Therefore, it is very important that we should ban such harmful pesticides. Right? Now, what do you think would be the source of pesticide in these food items? Like I told you, the one that is present, some will remain in the fruits and vegetable also and some will be in the soil and when that gets mixed with the, when that gets mixed with the water, what happens? In water, there are aquatic animals, aquatic animals will eat that and then even when we consume that water, will get affected. Even when we consume the fishes also, it will get into our body. That is how they get into our bodies. That is what they have asked. Oh, how is it getting in? So, that is how it gets into our body. Okay. And then discuss what, what method could be applied to reduce our intake of pesticide. So, how can we reduce? How can we reduce our intake of pesticides? Okay. Aditya, anyway, in another half an hour, the physics class will be start. Physics mom will start the session. Okay. Okay. So, now, what happens is that some harmful chemicals, some harmful chemicals may enter our body. How? Through food chain. Okay. Now, example, pesticides and other chemicals, like I told you, it is washed down into the soil or water, like I told you. Okay. And from the soil, the plant will also observe them. It will be, uh, so even the fruits and vegetables will have them, right? And then from water bodies also, aquatic plants and animals take them up, right? And thus they enter the food chain. That is how they enter food chain. Okay, fine. And then the these chemicals, they are nothing but, do you think they can be degraded easily? No, right? They are non-degradable chemicals. So they get accumulated in our body. And that process, that is called as biological magnification. Always those life form which are present on top, they will get more chemicals. They will, you know, accumulate more chemical and that is called as biological magnification. So, thus cereals, vegetable, fruit, meat contain pesticide residues. They will have certain residues and their concentration is maximum in human body because the human occupy the top level in food 
chain. Okay. So, how can we reduce uh, the intake of pesticides? One is minimize the use of chemical pesticides. We should reduce that. Instead, we can use biofertilizers also. We can use biofertilizers and we should reduce the use of chemical, you know, chemical pesticides. Biopesticides are also available. Okay. And then you should wash your fruits and vegetables thoroughly before using them. Okay, fine. And then use organic fruits and vegetables because in organic farming, the amount of chemical that is used is very minimum or it is not used at all. Over there, they use biopesticides, they use biofertilizers. So, it would be better if you make use of, if you use organic fruits and vegetables or wash your vegetables and fruits properly before consuming and then minimize the use of chemical pesticide. Okay, clear with that? So, let us see our next activity. Find out from the library, internet or newspaper reports that which chemical are responsible for the depletion of ozone layer. What is responsible for depletion of ozone layer? You want me to do case based studies also? Okay, I will do that in the next session. In the upcoming sessions, I will do that. Okay. So, now what is responsible for the depletion of ozone layer? Which is that chemical? It is CFC, right? It is CFC. Now, find out if the regul regulations put in place to control the emission of these chemicals have succeeded in reducing the damage to the ozone layer as the size of the hole in the ozone layer changed in recent year is the question. So, what causes, what is it actually? It is CFC, right? It is CFC. Usually, uh, where do you, is this, where was it used in, in 1980s? In 1980s, see the amount of ozone layer that time it started depleting. Why? It is because of the chemical chlorofluorocarbon which is used in refrigerators and also in fire extinguishers. Okay. So, now in 1987, the United Nations Environment Program, they made an agreement, why? To stop the use of this CFC, to stop the use of CFC and then now it is mandatory to make CFC free refrigerator. Now, it is not at all used, actually it is actually stopped, it is banned. This is the action that was taken by the government. Okay, clear with that. Shall we move on to next activity then? It is very simple, no? It is CFC which causes the depletion of ozone layer. When was it noticed? In 1980 and then 1926, 27 that time they discussed this issue and then they agreed that they should stop the CFC and now though it is mandatorily we have to use a CFC free refrigerator. Okay. We will move on to next activity then. <coughs> Collect waste material from your home. This could include all the waste that is generated during a day. Like it can be kitchen waste, wet waste, right? And along with that it can be waste paper, empty medicine bottle, strips and then bubble packs, old or torn cloths and broken food were nothing but it will have both wet waste as well as dry waste. Okay. And now what are we supposed to do? Bury this material in a pit, in a school garden or if there is no space available, you can collect the material in old basket or flower pot or cover with at least 15 centimeter of soil. Just cover it up. Okay. And keep this material moist and observe after 15 days. After 15 days, what are the materials that remain unchanged over large, longer period of time? So, you have to collect both dry waste and wet waste. Okay, and then what uh, what are you supposed to do? Bury them in your school ground, like if there is any free area in your school, or else take a pot, bury them, just place those waste and cover it with soil and let it stay for 15 days. After 15 days, you will have to check that what are the materials that remain unchanged. The materials, the waste material which remain unchanged, and what are the material which change their form and structure over time, which has undergone change, which has not undergone change. And of these material that are changed, which one changes faster? You will have to notice which materials have changed, which, which materials have not changed and 
which one has changed faster you will have to notice that okay so aditya says cfc reaches ozone layer and each chlorine molecule present in cfc it breaks down one molecule of yes that is true aditya it's correct okay so now see your waste material will have uh, i told you wet waste and dry waste dry waste waste let's say there will be paper there will be plastic bottle covers and all that out of that those you know even from kitchen milk packets will be there right see this milk packet medicine bottle you know strips plastic covers all these substances they are not broken down at all it cannot be degraded why because they are non degradable and they are made up of harmful chemicals they are made up of plastics and it is it can be glass also or nylon these cannot be broken down easily they cannot be broken down easily whereas other it would have you know like uh, it can be vegetable waste kitchen waste when i say kitchen waste it can be vegetable waste and all that they will get degraded easily in that 15 days that too fastly whereas it is these material which will not get degraded because they are non biodegradable they it, it is made up of plastic glass and nylon okay so now that was the activity you had to observe that which waste will change faster and which will not those dry wastes these dry wastes will not change faster because they are made up of these okay so now let's see what is our next activity all about it is linked with the previous one okay so now use the library or internet to find out more about biodegradable and non biodegradable substances how long are various non biodegradable substances expected to last in our environment and then these days new types of plastics which are said to be biodegradable are available find out more about such materials whether they do or do not harm the environment first you will have to find out what are non biodegradable and biodegradable waste and how long will they last in our environment and then nowadays there are certain plastics that are available in the market which are biodegradable you will have to name them okay so now what are some of the biodegradable material the plant products wood paper food waste leaves all these are biodegradable and even the remains of dead body plant and animal waste animal and human excreta and all that all these are biodegradable whereas non biodegradable are plastic products it can be you know grocery bags plastic bags and it can be water bottles also that you get and what also metals tins metal scrapes and all that these are non biodegradable along with that the construction waste and then the rubber tires man made fibers like nylon these are also non biodegradable and also certain computer hardware like glass cd dvds and cell phones see all these they fall under e waste right they are also non biodegradable it can be cable wire and all that so now let's see this non biodegradable substances how long will it take to degrade or to be broken down see even they will be broken down but the period is very very long see let's talk about glass bottle glass bottle it takes 500 years it takes 500 years for it to break down and plastic bags plastic bag also it takes 10 to 20 years 10 to 20 years to be you know to get degraded along with that there are plastic containers which takes 50 to 20 years it takes 50 to 80 years for it to break down and also plas plastic soda bottles the soda bottles also it takes 450 years to break down and then there are nylon fabric which takes 30 to 40 years for it to break see these non biodegradable substances are so dangerous they does not get degraded so easily instead they get accumulated and they cause harm to our environment see it takes lots of year for it to break right so now what is the solution now there are certain plastics that are available which can be degradable okay such plastics are see polyacetic acid these are biodegradable plastic you must remember these biodegradable plastic because in your exam you will have to mention these example at least 3 to 4 examples you will have to mention like see polyacetic acid and polyhydroxy alkanoates polybutanyl succinate starch blends 
cellulose based plastics polyhydrochloric acid and polycaprolactone and all so out of this if you remember if you mention any three example also it is fine these are the examples for biodegradable plastics okay they get degraded very easily so those non biodegradable plastics can be replaced by these biodegradable plastics these are eco friendly okay shall we move on to next question then next activity find out what happens to the waste that is generated at home is there a system in place to collect this waste yes it is right and then find out how the local body like panchayat municipal corporation uh, resident welfare association deal with the waste are there mechanism in place to treat the biodegradable and non biodegradable waste separately is the question calculate how much waste is generated at home in a day so this is activity which you will have to do that activity you will have to do that okay and then how much of this waste is biodegradable how much of this waste is biodegradable okay so there is a student aditya who says biodegradable is because of microorganism yeah decomposes like yes they can break down only the natural products like paper and wood yes aditya but nowadays like i showed you in the previous slide there are certain biodegradable plastics also which have been under use now okay hi lalit hi okay so almost we have few activities left we are almost done with that and already just before few minutes there was a student who was asking me to do dihybrid cross so after these two activities i'll just perform dihybrid cross and after that if you have any doubt you can comment in the comment section okay students so fine this one you will have to do it calculate how much waste so anyway it's okay students even if you no, don't do it now it's fine such type of question will not be asked in the exam why i'm doing this activity based is that i want you all to understand the concept really well that's why in case if they ask competency based question from this part it will be easy for you to answer that's why okay and then let's see how much of this waste is biodegradable and suggest ways of dealing with this waste okay clear so now see here uh, this it should be done by you people in your house see because it varies from one for from one house to another house right okay so now let's see at home and classroom there are various biodegradable non biodegradable waste okay and they have to be collected separately and they should be treated properly also okay uh, nowadays also you nowadays it is a rule right it is mandatory i feel it is i guess it is in every city it is like that you will have to separate dry waste and waste, wet waste if you don't separate them then uh, will be fine right they will you know you will have to pay the fine nowadays they have made it mandatory so that it can be treated easily because non biodegradable waste certain waste they can be recycled again that's why whereas biodegradable waste they can be used to prepare manure and all that bio uh, fertilizers and all that okay they will be treated properly and in case if it is not treated properly then you know the local bodies like you can complain there it can be panchayat or municipal corporation resident welfare association if in case if not treating if the waste in your locality is not treated properly then you can complain them and they can take action okay and they have a mechanism to treat this these waste and then they collect the waste segregate them nowadays actually we are supposed to segregate them both wet and dry waste will be segregated separately okay and then they are stored in separate waste baskets like i told you the certain non degradable waste will be recycled degradable they can be used to prepare manures and all that okay clear with that now the improvement in the lifestyle and change in the attitude have generated much amount of waste material like changes in packing have resulted in much of a waste becoming non biodegradable that's why now we can use biodegradable uh, plastics older days that opportunity was not there right so now how can we deal with this waste there are two methods how one is by like i told you recycling and the other one is preparation of compost like from biodegradable waste you can prepare manure and all that 
from non biodegradable you can recycle them okay so yeah aditi yes your answer is right ma'am food uh, ma'am food chain the number power increasing what lalit can you come again i didn't get you what you are saying i zoe and aditya says as the decomposition of the biodegradable waste is slow they produce awful smell and yeah when inhaled yes it can be harmful also yeah true yes aditya true okay so yeah i guess this is the last one this is the last activity from the chapter our environment okay so search internet or library to find out what hazardous material have to be dealt with while disposing of you know electronic items how would these material affect the environment okay and then find out how plastics are recycled does the recycling process have any impact on environment see recycling is a good thing it will actually protect us right so now let's say these you know electronic waste e waste they are very harmful because they have certain harmful chemicals like they have mercury lead cadmium uh, polybrominate flame and ba uh, barium lithium and all that which is very harmful so they cause damage to the brain heart liver kidney skeleton system and all that see when you dispose them what if it gets mixed with the soil okay ma'am food chain question 10 100000 like that question okay you are talking about the 10% uh, law i guess you are talking about the 10% law the flow of energy see always that is simple okay let me finish this it's almost done and then the recycling of plastic or non biodegradable waste is actually advisable recycling is it will actually protect our environment okay so i guess this is it we are done with this with all the activities yes lalit you are i guess you are talking about that uh, 10% law see the thing is in that pyramid in that pyramid see the uh, first thing is it is plant right producers will be placed at the bottom right so now uh, what happens is that the producer nothing but the plant is capable of capturing that solar energy it will capture that solar energy right so now let's say it captures 100 per it out of whatever it captures out of that only 1% of the solar energy is available for the next level why what about other 99% the plant will utilize those energy for it to carry out certain processes it can be digestion respiration and all that and then the left 1% the left 1% is transferred to the next trophic level now let's say after plant it is deer so now the deer eats that plant and it gets that 1% of the solar energy now out of that 1% out of that 1% now let's say 90% is utilized by the deer and another 10% will be available to the next trophic level again the deer utilizes that 90% of that 1% for its processes to carry out again uh, certain important life processes right remaining 10% is sent to the next trophic level like that so every time when the energy is passed on from one trophic level to another trophic level it decreases the energy decreases actually okay whereas the toxic content will get accumulated more in the top most level that is called as biomagnification and whereas the one which i told you always the energy that is transferred is less so the top most level will get less energy compared to the lower most or compared to the primary level okay clear with that and then there was a student there was a student who had asked me to you know draw the dihybrid cross dihybrid cross in tree plant should i draw that so aditya says the basic composition of e waste yes okay especially yes aditya it is your answer is right you are welcome lalit you are welcome so there was a student who wanted me to draw the dihybrid cross should i draw that i'll just draw that maybe later that student might watch okay so dihybrid cross in pea plant here we are uh, you know considering uh, we what are the characteristic that we are considering in dihybrid cross 
uh, the shape of the seed and the color of the seed right now let's say uh, see you know yellow color is dominant and the shape the round is also dominant and then the other one is green is recessive and wrinkled is recessive that will be green in color okay let's see this is yellow and round and the other one is it is green and uh, it is wrinkled it is green and wrinkled okay so now let's say that see here there is capital y capital r and here small y and small r right when that is crossed you will get capital y small y capital r small r which means to say that here the dominant yellow color is there and round is also there so the one that you get is it is round and yellow it is round and yellow okay this is our first generation this is f1 upon self crossing upon self crossing ma'am in exam they will they will give they will give to draw the diagram yes you will have to biology you will have to draw diagram they mention it or not when the question is asked for 3 mark and 5 mark diagram is mandatory okay and this crossing also you should be very careful okay you will have to you know mention this tableau column also when they ask dihedral cross a monohedral cross is easy dihedral cross most of the students they get confused and they make mistakes so you should be careful with that so now let's say there is capital y doing it right you are also doing it capital r So, what do you think will be the ratio, students? Can you comment in the comment section? What will be the, what will be the genotype and phenotype of this students? Can you tell the phenotypic ratio of this? So now there is capital Y, capital Y, okay, capital Y, capital Y, capital R, small R, and now again capital Y, small Y, capital R, and capital R. When capital Y, small Y. And capital R, small r. Okay, again let's cross this. Capital Y, capital Y, capital R, and small. Capital. So now capital Y, small y, capital R, small r. Now for example, okay, there is a student Aditya. No, 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 Aditya. Dihybrid cross. It includes crossing or breeding of two plant. Yes, two characters. That's why it is dihybrid. Yes, these crosses are also known. Mendel cross. Yes, that is done on pea plant. Yes, for example, a cross. Yes, it is two. Now, Aditya, can you say what will be the phenotypic ratio of this dihybrid cross? So now, capital Y, small y, small r, small r, right? Capital Y, small y, capital R, capital R. Now again, there is capital Y, small y, capital R, small r, okay, and then small y, capital R, capital R, okay, and then comes this one, small y, capital R, small r, and then comes capital Y, small y, capital R, small r. The phenotypic ratio, the phenotypic ratio of this, then capital Y, small y, small, okay. 
Tiens. Bon, un an. So now let's check, right? Let's see the one. See this one. This is yellow and round. Okay, one yellow and round. Even here this is yellow and round. Okay, even here it is yellow and round. Here also, capital Y, small r is the yellow and round. Okay. And then again here yellow and round is there. Here only yellow is there. It is not round, it is wrinkled. So, it is, let us say, yellow and wrinkled. And then again, yellow and round is here. Here again, yellow and wrinkled. Okay. And then next, again here, there is yellow and R. Yellow and R. Yellow and it is round, when I say. And then comes here, it is not yellow. Instead, it is green and round. Here it is green and round okay and again over here it is green and round fine and then where else you get to see green and round okay so now again over here it is yellow and round yellow and wrinkled and again here it is green and round right this is green and round and again here it is green and wrinkled, right? It is green and wrinkled. So, what will be the phenotypic ratio? So, now let us see how many yellow and round is there. See this one, 1, 2, 3, 4, right? 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9. So, you got, I will write here, 9, it is yellow and round. Okay. So, now let us check yellow and wrinkled. How many yellow and wrinkled is there? I will change the color. Let me make it red. 1, 2, 3, 3 yellow and wrinkled is there, right? So, 3 yellow and wrinkled fine after that after that let me use blue color for uh, the complete and that is only one before that let me use green color there which one is green and it is round three green and round is there again three green and round okay and then there is only one there is only one one green and wrinkled green and wrinkled okay so what is the phenotypic ratio what is the phenotypic ratio it is 9 is 2 3 is 2, 3 is 2, 1. It is 9 is 2, 3 is 2, 3 is 2, 1 is the phenotypic ratio of the dihybrid cross. Ma'am, uh, typing mera slow hai, nahi to copy me. Okay. See, the thing is, Aditya, I guess you would have typed before itself. By the time I receive message, it is taking time. Okay. In this case, the dihybrid cross of the pea plant. When the parent with the homozygous condition of genotype, yes, it is wrong. Yes, sir, it is correct. Hi, 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 students. So, okay, so there was a student who had actually asked me in the beginning to draw the dihybrid cross. Okay, this is how it is done. You should be careful. So, you can capital Y, capital Y, small y, small y, and then R, capital R, small r, capital R, small r. The same thing you can place over here also, and then when you cross it, you will get it correctly. Okay, students, clear with that? This is the dihybrid cross, which is performed by Mendel A P plant, and this is your phenotypic ratio. Clear with this, students? So we have come to an end of this session. We are almost done, right? So this is it for today's session. We are done with. 
all the activity questions, okay. And uh, like some of you have suggested to come up with competency based question, I will do that in the next session. And then there was a student who was asking 9th standard marathon also, yes we will be starting 9th as well, 9th standard as well, I will be teaching biology for 9th as well. Okay students, so this is it for today's session and uh, I hope you all are doing good. How is your preparation going on students? How is your preparation going on? I know you all are going to rock in the exam, right? Stay calm, stay calm, do not take stress, okay? It is okay now whatever time is left with that, utilize that properly, revise concepts again and again, revision is very important, okay? And give your best, okay? Ma'am, electricity ka, what electricity? Now anyway, physics ma'am will start the physics class. I guess, okay. So, this is it for today's session. Okay, students, good, good, okay. So, yeah, thank you all. Thank you all for your patience and active listening and uh, in the next session, I will come up with the competency based question as well. Okay, students. So, thank you all and all the best for your preparation and have a 